Welcome to What's Poppin'. I am your host, Ken Jack, and I am very happy today to be joined by Ron Funches. Ron, what's going on? What is poppin' besides that jacket? That jacket is poppin'. I've been getting some... Wait, I want to know what you think of this shirt, too, actually. Hold on. Let's, we'll do a full display. Okay, I don't know if you're a fan of any of the above, but I got Rock, Zelda, Britney Spears, and also Yu-Gi-Oh! across the bottom. What, what do That's... you think's better? <laughs> Well, The Rock, of course. The Rock's my favorite out of anyone. But that is a that is a shirt. That is a shirt. I have a, a sweater that's almost as bad as that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super happy to have you on. We're here to talk about Chop 420. Going to give you the quick, and I'll give you the synopsis that I was given, but you feel free to correct me once we're done. Hosted by yourself, Chop 420 breaks new ground with each episode featuring four budding cannabis chefs, oh, that's a nice pun, who are challenged to create tasty and mind-warping dishes throughout three rounds, appetizer, entree, and dessert from a mystery basket of ingredients for the chance to win 10 grand. It's going to be available to stream on Discovery Plus on April 20th. What's your pitch, though? Because that's, again, the synopsis we just get given. I like that one, though. Yeah, it's a pretty good one. They're good at their jobs. Uh, my pitch would be a lot of people like we, more people like food. Some people like me. We've mixed them all together and made a fun show. Please check it out. <laughs> I like that. I like much more succinct and to the point. Um, they were nice enough to send me the first episode and I went through it. Um, something I like about the show is that it takes place outdoors and it almost gives me like a, like a British Bake Off type vibe, if that makes sense. Have you watched that before? Hell yeah, that's one of my favorite shows. <laughs> Does that like uh, help it just feel a little bit more free than maybe like the closed up set of like the actual Chopped or like Cut Through Kitchen or any of those ones? Is this more like open and airy? I think, it, yeah, it gives it just, I mean, Palm Springs is just a good vibe. So it's nice. And it's a place where a lot of people like to smoke weed and hang out. I think the open air is good so that we could smoke weed and didn't have to worry about people coming by. And I think it was actually just a happy byproduct of having to shoot during the pandemic, where if we wanted to do it in the kitchen, we couldn't have that many people there, you know? So sure. we had to have it outside in a way, and they just found a way to make Palm Springs like a character in the show. So I think it really worked out well. I, I, I definitely noticed that it gives it more of a like a light airy feel that we're just out having fun mm -hmm. and it definitely does a more fun vibe than um, the more traditional chopped I liked a lot um the you were especially in the first episode again I only had the first so I, I can't speak for your outfits for the rest of the uh, season but your suit in the first episode was awesome and the first thing I thought was is he trying to show up Ted Allen right now because Ted Allen has never had a suit that nice <laughs> I just trying to look good and show off. Um, and it, was it the was it the bright one, the bright orange? It was big, bright, and then it had like a multicolor, like um, like it was held almost every color in the rainbow shirt underneath, and then you had the kerchief on the side too. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, and then I mean that's that's from the personal collection. That's yeah. from a great designer I know and love named Rich Fresh. It was out here in L.A. It was actually I bought some things when I was uh, doing my old game show for Quibi. May may she rest in peace. And but so I never got to wear it. So it was. I was like, well, now, now we figure out a way to wear it. And I'm, I'm loving, and I appreciate you saying that, because that's the thing I try to do in comedy in general is like a lot of, you know, there's usually a, a kind of a, a, a stereotype of male comedians who dress all schlubby and don't try. And I like, you know, I might not be wearing a suit all the time, but I love style. I love me. I could tell like you do, you know, you could be wearing a rock Yu-Gi-Oh! Britney Spears. That's style though. That style, that jacket is style. I love fucking good style. So I'm sorry if I don't know if I could curse or not. But... No, it's cursing. <laughs> cursing friendly. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I love style so much. So I appreciate that compliment. It was, yeah, very, it adds a nice level of personal flavor to it. No, like, it's not like a, the traditional game show host where they just wear the same thing. It's just, you know, beige coat, beige under jacket. It's like not trying to pop out. I like it. It's very, the whole show itself is very vibrant, but I think that that adds to it. Uh, side question. Do you think Ted Allen smokes weed? <laughs> I would not think so. I wouldn't think so. Well, I would love it. I would love it if we had one scene on my show of me smoking a joint and I go to pass it and he pull out and it's Ted Allen. I would love 
<laughs> the visual of Ted Allen hitting a bong is honestly actually hysterical. It's just it like, he wouldn't know what to is. do. It truly is. Oh, yeah. yeah but that's actually um, that leads things makes me think about like when I first got there on the first day, I was kind of trying to do a Ted Allen impression. You know, I was a little more reserved. I was trying to like just lay back and let the because I was just watching episodes of Chop and I was like, oh, it seems like the judges kind of take over and Ted just introduces things and like moves things along. So I was like, oh, I'll do that. And then we did like the first round just the appetizer round of the first day and they were like oh you're doing a good job but like we need more you they were like mm -hmm. this isn't like chop featuring ron this is your show so go out and just do it like it's your they that's the best thing they ever said to me they go like treat it like it's your you're headlining a stand-up show and i was like okay that's great that's easy that i know how to do let's do it it's funny you mentioned that because I feel like I could almost notice that like it was a little more reserved in the first round. I think when they got into the entree round, there's a funny part where like you're um, you're going through like the the, uh, the I guess the pantry. Right. And you're like you find like that THC infused salt. And you're like THC infused salt. Who knew? And like I'm like laughing because like, again, you're injecting more personality as it goes on. And I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, there were already even just in the first episode some strange chefs in a good way. Uh, what's like one of the more strange moments of the season maybe that we can look forward to? Oh, well, I don't want to give away too much, but there are definitely some weird people. There are some people who uh, cut themselves. There's people, there might be a freak out or two uh, and that you could look forward to that I, I had to try to help uh, stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, but for the most part, they were all really cool people, real um, professional. I think I'm going to go the other way a little bit. There's a gentleman on there who I just kind of like, fell in love with as a person chef victor who um venezuelan guy f dad brought him here his dad ends up getting deported back to his country he's stuck in america and is like has to make a choice of either go back to his dad or try to make it out here he ends up working in kitchens his teenage life he gets him hooked on drugs. He gets himself off of drugs and gets starts um, working in a restaurant, loses his job in the pandemic and starts going like, what do I want to do? He just starts delivering a rapist on his bike in San Francisco. And you're like, holy crap, that's a workout for your ass. Seriously? And he's doing this for a year. And then Eater in San Francisco names this guy one of the top 10 restaurants in all of San Francisco. Now he's selling a rapist like crazy. He comes in the Chop 420 and I don't want to say how he did or not did, but I was just impressed with this man. And I was like, how can you not root for somebody like this? And that's what I learned a lot from this was like, just how much it meant to these chefs, how they had been a lot of them, a lot of them working at restaurants in pandemic. And that was, as we know, one of the industries that was decimated because of the pandemic. And for them to get a chance to win 10 grand and then not only that, a chance to like have that like scene on chop, chop champion on their resume meant a lot to them. And I, I just was like, man, this is fun and funny. But I also am like, I want to help these people. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure this show isn't a flop so that they can use this credit so that they can get more money, you know? And it, so that's why I'm like very passionate when I'm promoting it. That's awesome. I, I can't wait to see that story. And that's it is something that's always great about Chopped and like uh, almost all like the food competition shows is like hearing the sort of journey that a lot of these go through because a lot of the people on Chopped, I feel like aren't you know, um, people that like graduated like summa cum laude at some uh, culinary institutes, people that like grinded their way to get where they are. And it, those stories are very inspiring. And I like that a lot about um, the, not only just the contestants that I saw in the first episode, but now hearing that there's more of that in the future is super exciting. Uh, one of the other cool things I liked about this first episode is that I immediately thought it's going to shatter a lot of like stoner stereotypes for people because there's the expectation, I think, for like a layman of the world that like stoners are lazy, too relaxed or unmotivated. But like these chefs are like type A, competitive, super high motor. Do you think like that's going to surprise people? I absolutely do think it's going to surprise people. And that's something I knew. But yeah, I think kind of even if you just tell people to show they're they're thinking like two buddies hanging out, laughing, smoking things. But 
that's what I think is what chopped the the name chop brings to this is like oh it's a competition that they've they know how to work they perfected the rounds of it and sometimes you would see like the competitors come in and they're happy and they're like this is cool i get to work with marijuana some of them are a little hesitant to to get into the marijuana and then by the time we chop one person they get it they're like, oh, I'm in a fight here. I'm in a competition here. And you do, you get to see their skills come out. And, and like you said, I think the fun of it is seeing like these people who've worked in kitchens for their whole life. Some of them are trained in like, who have gone to these amazing school, Michelin star chefs who love working with marijuana. And they do, they want to break that stereotype of like, I mean, I want to break that stereotype. I hate that. It's one of the things I love when I go to other countries or go to Amsterdam where I'm like oh I can sit at a bar and smoke a joint and nobody's looking at me if I if I spilled this water over right now no one's gonna go oh you oh did you do that because you're stoned you know it's like to me it's legalization and then we got to get to normalization and and just doing like I work my ass off I have mm-hmm. for I wouldn't be where I was if I didn't work my ass off and I smoke pot every day. And so f- for me to get up at six in the morning, raise my son as a single dad, go off and do my stand up and smoke pot. And then and I have I've seen reviews of myself where they go, oh, he's just a lazy stoner comic. And I'm like, no, you're a lazy fucking writer because mm-hmm. you fell for the joke. You fell for the act. If you knew if you just Googled me and look at my IMDb you'd know the last thing you could say about me is lazy. Mm-hmm. No, totally agreed. Even just doing research ahead of this interview, I'm like, damn, man, this IMDb page is so many credits. It's insane. And especially for someone like, you're, you're only like, what, like 36? Like it's, 38. It's, Thank you, though. Two years back. <laughs> look, dude, you look younger than me and I'm 28. So, I mean, it's the same thing. It's But that's also, I have like that Eastern European mutt DNA where I'm going like, <laughs> to like age like a fucking raisin. It's horrible. Uh <laughs> But I want to talk to you. I love talking about this. We're going to get back to it later. But I want to talk about some of your other work as well. One thing I know a lot of LCD fans actually really like is Harley Quinn. And you voice King Shark in Harley Quinn. And obviously King Shark, now people are got a great look at in the new Suicide Squad trailer where he eats someone and rips them in half. And, and Sylvester Stallone is voicing him. Is it cool seeing like another iteration of your character like that? Or are you just like, as an actor, are you like, fuck, I wish that was me? Both. Absolutely both. I think it's cool that it was Sylvester Stallone because that's a legendary actor. And so, and it brings the more insight to that character. So then in by, you know, rising tide lifts all ships by definition, I got a lot more people who just found out about the Harley Quinn show and found out about my version because of the movie. And I very much like that. But also at the same time, I'm competitive and I like what I do. And I love my version of King Shark. I love that people tell me it's their favorite version of King Shark. And I think I am the best version of King Shark. Oh yeah. So I w- would have loved that opportunity to have done, maybe we can get a Funches cut. If we can- <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to hit up James Gunn about that for sure. You should have <laughs> should have slid into uh, Sly's DMs and like, hey, uh, you know, if you want tips about King Shark, yeah, let I'm me doing tell this for you a long how, time, yeah. kid. Let me show you about how he works, how his mind works. <laughs> yeah, just shark, just shark, you up, no, that's yeah. not how we do it. He's smart now. He's smart. <laughs> He's, <laughs> he that amazing He's royalty. Exactly. Uh, I also want to talk to you about Kroll Show as well, which is a show that I loved. Um, it's maybe one of the most talented casts I've ever seen, not even just from the main cast, which like you were part of then, but to the, all the reoccurring cast as well. Insane. I can't even imagine like what it was like working with them. How was that experience like as, as a writer as well, too? Yeah, it was amazing because it was one of my first jobs when I got to Los Angeles. I had opened for Nick, I'd opened for John Mulaney, and um, I'd worked with John Daly a little bit on some things. And so when they got their second season, they pretty much just... Um, they kind of forced because at the time I wasn't known at anything. I never written in anything. I had no um, uh, credits. And so they forced Comedy Central to give me the job. And I wasn't even that good at it. I didn't know what to do. And so <laughs> credit to Nick, credit to the crew there is that they like 
basically just let me learn and let me watch them and watch uh, Gabe Liebman, who's now one of the best writers and producers. And, and, and if you look up his IMDb, you'd be like, damn, this guy writes on the best shows there are. And I shared an office with him and he taught me so much about writing sketches and they didn't like, um, the smartest thing like I think that they could have done for Nick is that they just started they're like oh like well he's not as good as writing in other people's voices let's just have him write sketches that he's in <laughs> and like, so, <laughs> so I you know they put me in some sketches they let me write those I wrote some of the um CCR sketches because that was a voice that I could understand from being in Oregon for so long and uh but I was I was well aware like at the time even at the time I was like this is an amazing roster of talent because like even Jenny Slate was just blowing up then just starting to blow up but I just would watch her in scenes and I'd be like I've been around talented people before but I've never been around someone so talented that it intimidates me like <laughs> that I'm scared of how talented you are and just being around them Jason Masnukas but uh you know Nick the whole cast i was like this is going to be a show that stands up like stella like whitest kids like uh you know kids in the hall to me the crow show is a top-notch sketch show like those shows and i um it's one of the best things that i mean i still have some props and stuff in my house from it because like i i have fond memories of that I agree. No, I feel like I haven't seen a sketch comedy show like even on the level of it until I watched um, uh, I think you should leave with Tim Robinson, which I, I just that show I binged through like crazy. I can because it's 15 minutes long. I'm through that in no time at all. It's so funny. Yeah, um, I think Nathan for you is up there, but I don't yes. know if you call that a sketch show, though. Right. Like that's more of a it's, um, it's like mockumentary animal. style. Yeah. It's weird. I feel like it's hard to classify a sketch, but I, I would agree with you. Definitely. Nathan for you is hilarious. So funny. I actually have um, a Summit Ice shirt. I think somewhere in <laughs> <laughs> deny nothing or whatever the slogan was. That was so funny. Um, explain to me what like the writer's room experience was like, because like for me, I'll write sketches for um, like our, my podcast, for example. And for me, it's just, I'm sitting down on Google Docs doing it all myself and I'll write it all out. But like the experience for a sketch comedy show where you have like a writer's room, what's that like? I'm happy because it'd be good information for people who want to know. Um, basically, uh, it was very organized. It was always a schedule where like for the first maybe hour, two hours, everyone would sit in a group and we would just pitch random ideas, like anything that you wanted. It was an open pitch and you could just pitch your ideas out and, you know, people would add on to them or change them or they just go, I don't think this would work or it doesn't work for this show. Uh, and then after those two hours are up, they go through those because someone's writing them down. They go through the stack, just pick which ones. And then people would team up in groups of two, usually, or your office mate, me and Gabe or whoever and whoever. And then you would go in and take that sketch idea. And then before lunch, you need to have a full one page rough draft of it. And then you they turn in that draft. They look at it. They give it back to you if they want to continue on or they go go pick another idea out the box and start over uh, and so I learned a lot about that about like you know taking the um, free open thing and then refining free open and refine and um, I also learned that I'm just not great um, in a writer's room because I have I think one of the things that is special about me is is how unique my voice is is how unique my viewpoint is and I just have a hard time writing for other people so um that's why like after Kroll show and then i wrote uh on the eric andre show but i haven't mm -hmm. written on I, I will pitch and write jokes for different pilots and things but i don't see myself in another writer's room unless it's for like my show gotcha that would make sense if you're like the lead dog on it and like yeah. that collaborative the collaborative atmosphere i'm sure is just helpful if you're able to like Maybe if you have an idea, like this happens to me like all the time, like I'll have an idea where like, I know the core of it's okay, but I have no idea how to continue it. But having mm -hmm. other voices able to augment it and just yeah. make everything better, I'm sure helps Still to this day, I don't like writing in a vacuum. I always prefer writing with a partner just because mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I can just get so tunnel vision of yeah. like, this is a thing. But if you bounce in, it's just like a lot like stand up. Like, oh, we're just bouncing around. Make, oh, that's funny. That's funny. And you just tag it on top of each other. And then you got a sketch. And I, I, I to me, that's like, 
it's almost like problem solving or philosophy where you're just like, you're like, oh, wow, we just used our minds together and we created something. It's one of mm-hmm. the best feelings in the world to me. You, you've done a lot of comedy, obviously. And I think something we've noted a lot, especially on our podcast anyway, is just that there's over the last 10 years, there haven't been a lot of like monumentally huge comedy movies, but there have mm-hmm. been a lot of great comedy shows. Mm-hmm. And just how hard is it to get, a, let's say a comedy movie made right now? If you have like a great idea, you have a crew, you have stuff, how hard is it to get a comedy movie made? Oh, I think it's insanely hard just because everything is so st- structured and um, more um, assembly line now, you know, there's so many chefs. So I think to, it, in some ways it's, e- like because technology is making it easier it is easy to make these smaller things but like um i talk about my wife i talk about my friends all the time it just seems like these smaller comedy movies that i grew up on that i love that taught me my sense of humor seemed to have like disappeared in a way and it's something that i i I try to write for and try to create but it seems like studio comedies you know they're just going trends you know and mm-hmm. for a while, when Hangover hit, they were like, boom, let's make all these studio comedies. And then they're like, oh, no, wait, no, everybody likes action movies. They like uh, all Marvel movies. So we'll, we'll put a little bit of humor in there, but there, we don't need to be making these comedy movies anymore. And that's why I got to just take a quick second and just say that there is one that just came out. Bad Trip from Bad Eric trip, Andre. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's his viewpoint. It's his from the very opening, from the first scene when he's running through the as soon as he's running from his house trying to get to work and he stops and opens a door for a lady. Yeah. I was like, if you know Eric Andre at all, that's fucking Eric Andre. That's him to a T. That's his voice. That's his viewpoint. And that whole movie is so sweet and so raunchy at the same time. And I just, any chance I get, I like to just, because that's true, because I had just the day before been like, when's there going to be a good comedy movie? I haven't seen one. And then I was like, well, I've seen one today. <laughs> <laughs> That movie, I was, I remember, so we were, we had to review it and like, I was like, oh, I don't want to watch like a hidden camera movie thing. Like these, ha- I, I haven't watched one of these since like Jackass, or not Jackass, but like, like stuff like Jackass. I'm like, I don't know if I want to see this. I was crying laughing watching that movie. It is so goddamn funny. Uh, I forget what we rated it. It was very high, but I, I love that movie. And like you said, Eric Andre, he is such a distinct and unique voice. And it is very, it is so endearing. I think is the best way to describe it. And uh, absolutely. Very much Absolutely. love that movie. This is an um, amazing movie. And another thing I want to talk to you about, which I'm pretty sure you're a fan of, is video games. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're streaming on Twitch right now. <laughs> uh, hell yeah. <laughs> Fucking stomping on the interview. Perfect. They, uh, what's your... <laughs> so uh, something we also talk about a lot is just how we, there isn't a ton of great video game releases every year. There's usually like one, it feels like almost every few years at this point where like they'll have like 10 years of development going into it mm-hmm. and sometimes it works great like with like red dead 2 or whatever but sometimes it fails like with cyberpunk Cyberpunk, yeah yeah and yeah now is a big time failure uh but what's your most favorite recent video game or a video game that you think more people should be playing Ooh, folks favorite recent game wow that's a great question um man because i've been playing a lot of old games so <laughs> no recommended oh, old I'm going to go with Nintendo. Um, I think especially during the pandemic, like I like games that just make me smile and give me joy. And, and, and I think nothing quite does that like a Nintendo game. I really like this Bowser's Fury game on Switch. Like it's a nice open world um, Mario game where you can just run around and swim around and ride on a little dinosaur. And uh, it makes me laugh. It makes me smile. It's the controls. Well, I think it's one. I think it's probably what my favorite. My, Either that or Hitman 3 were my favorite game this year so far. Um, but uh, Portal 2. Portal 2 had 10-year mm-hmm. anniversary yesterday or two days ago. And uh, i just been playing that on my stream on Twitch, on Twitch.tv. Ron underscore Funch is my Twitch gets mm-hmm. mad if I don't promote it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just... I like I love how funny it is. I love how it makes me think. Um, if you haven't played Portal 2 or if you haven't played it in a while, go back and play that. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't done that in a while, or like Half Life, or um, even what are some of the other ones? Oh, so over quarantine, I got a Switch, and I I think the first few games I got were I got Zelda Breath of the Wild, which was mm-hmm. incredible, so good. 
Um, I think I, oh, and Animal Crossing too, because then my, me and my girlfriend would just sit there and play it for hours and hours and hours and hours and just, so you're simulating real life, but still it's just- Animal like Crossing saved lives in the exactly. pandemic. Exactly. Completely agreed. And now I'm stuck playing PC, like real-time strategy games, because that's just the way my brain works. I what wanna, are you playing? Play Rome 2 Total War now, because the new okay. ones, they're doing the reimagining soon, coming out on Steam. Um, and then some other ones. I think I'm going to do Valheim soon, because I've heard Valheim mm -hmm. is really good. It's fun. I like it. I didn't think I would, because I don't like Minecraft type stuff. But mm -hmm. it's pretty fun. I mean, I'm always like, I, I guess I'm just a traditionalist where I'm like, I like to shoot stuff. So I, <laughs> I get a little missing of that. But like, I like I like new experiences. I've just always been big into like adventure games or story games. And I'm um, excited for the new Ratchet and Clank. And uh, oh, yeah. Yes, that's one thing of the game I'm most excited for. Yeah, no, agreed. That and open world games, like I used to be big in all the Bethesda ones, like, uh, mm -hmm. or it's the way, to be honest. But um, whenever the new uh, Elder Scrolls will come out, I'll be all over that. And there's a lot. Uh, what's your favorite video game of all time? Of all, all time. time, it's changed. It was Super Mario 3. That was my favorite game of all time because I just loved it as a little kid. And, and then I loved the movie from The Wizard. And I loved uh, when I went and played it as an adult and beat every level. I loved it. However, it is now Super Mario World just because mm. during the pandemic um, is a game that I played I think I actually played it before we got married. Yeah, we were still engaged, but she was my fiance. Me and my wife played through Super Mario World together. And it was just so much fun playing. It took us a couple months <laughs> to get, because we weren't warping around. We were just like, we're just going to get through levels. And just playing through Super Mario World with her, I think is, it made me fall more in love with her. It made me fall more in love with the game. And now it's my favorite game of all time. I love that. I love that. I love revisiting old games too. Just there's nothing like it. Nothing like just getting back on the old console. It feels like uh, I'm just getting on a bike for the first time in a while. Yeah, especially when you play a genre that they don't really do as much anymore, like yeah. platformers. That's why I like the new Odd World Soulstorm as well, because it's like, oh, I haven't played an old school Prince of Persia type jump in platformer in a long time. Yeah, I kind of went out on Prince of Persia since the Jake Gyllenhaal movie. Uh, but that was, that was a long time ago. That <laughs> hey, was a Sands wild of Time. Sands of Time was a classic. That was a All good time one. classic. All right. Thank you so much for joining Ron. Once again, Chop 420 uh, streaming on Discovery Plus on April 20th, 420. Do you, if you're listening right now, do you get the joke? Do you get it? <laughs> okay, pretty sure. Just making sure everyone understands the joke completely. All right. Uh, thank you again so much for joining me. I'd love to have you back anytime. We can talk more. I could do a full 30 minutes just on video games if you're I love talking games, please. <laughs>